Uh, so now we we got plenty of time. And with that in mind, we decided to you know, spend this episode reviewing some of the coaching hires and discussing uh, some of the biggest moves that might, in some way, in some places, reshape the sport. If you've got Norlander's coaching changes tracker bookmark, you likely know two things. One, it's a 19-minute read. What do you want from me? <laughs> I got to give capsules on these things. There oh. are there are 54 coaching changes. Of course it's a 19 minute read. Of course it is. <laughs> now, hold on though. It has it has evolved. If we went back 3 weeks ago, this thing this puppy is a sweet old like 9 minute read. Oh but wow. It changes. Don't worry. I'm going to give it another edit. I'll try and get this down for UGP. I'm going to try once Elon fills its spot by the end of the week, which I expect to happen, I'll try and get this puppy down to 15 minutes for you. Okay? It's fine. Like the little like the little bitty capsules are fine. I just wanted to goof on the fact I that know. I did notice when I clicked on it is a 19 minute read. The second thing you probably know is that there are 13 new coaches in what we generally regard as the best six conferences in college basketball. It's the five power conferences, uh, power five conferences, plus uh, the Big East. Um it breaks down like this. Thad Mata is the new coach at Butler. John Shire is the new coach at Duke. Ty Golden, new coach at Florida. Mike White is the new coach at Georgia. Jerome Tang, new coach at Kansas State. Kenny Payne, new coach at Louisville. Matt McMahon, new coach at LSU. Kevin Willard's the new coach at Maryland. Chris Jans, new coach at Mississippi State. Dennis Gates, the new coach at Missouri. Shaheen Holloway is the new coach at Seton Hall. Lamont Paris, new coach at South Carolina. And Sean Miller is the new coach at Xavier. Deadleg, let's start with this question. Of those 13 new coaches at new places in power conferences, which one will be doing the best at his job three years from today? Three years. Okay. So we're not we're not trying to predict like, you know, let's go 10 years into the future and who's done the best. We're just trying to get a look three years into the future, who will have done the best job. That's a and it's all relative to expectation. Reminder as we get into this, because there's a lot of parish, there's a lot of really intriguing hires. I go back to Two months ago, trying to figure out, trying to predict what jobs would open, what jobs wouldn't, looking at candidates. And at the time, thinking, all right, what kind of what kind of coaching candidates are out there for these jobs? Like, is this going to be a, a deal where we have, you know, seven or eight jobs open in the power conferences? And there might be one or two interesting names, but there might be just some some, you know, hires that, that are made that you're kind of like, eh, that's not the case here. There's a ton. And I am including Shire. You know, to Duke, even though we've known he's the deal, he's actually officially he's taken over in an official capacity as the head coach in the past week or so. In fact, just as we started this podcast, Emil Jefferson was as expected promoted to assistant coach at Duke there. Three years from now, I think relative to expectation is the important thing. If you want to say overall who's done the best, I think your three biggest candidates are Sean Miller at Xavier, Dad Mata at Butler, and John Shire at Duke. And the reason why I would say those three is, well, you take a look at what Sean Miller and Thad have done. Each have coached 17 seasons. Sean Miller has won 73% of his games. Thad Mata has won 74% of his games. Thad Mata has a 24-13 and 13 NCAA tournament record, has obviously made a national championship game in multiple Final Fours. Sean Miller has made multiple Elite Eights, has a 19-11 and 11 NCAA tournament record. Um, the last time he was at Xavier, Xavier was in a 10 school. He went 120 and 47 there. Overall, Sean Miller's won 422 games. Thad Mata's won 439. From a pure win percentage experience standpoint, coaches that have been at those places, which is obviously a trope this season, you've got familiar faces returning to places they once were. It's them. And then it's John Shire, who seems to be dead set on. Uh, landing every imaginable five star possible for ne from now until all of eternity. Because what do I got two calls from coaches, one in the ACC, one outside the ACC in a power conference in the past 72 hours. And uh, one coach specifically called me to say, John Shire is recruiting right now at a level that Mike Krzyzewski as the head coach never did. If you look at what he has done in the 2022 class and the 23 class, it's insane. Now we might see, I don't know if this is going to be the case. We might see a case where, Nolan Smith, by virtue of having left Duke to go to Louisville, maybe we see one or two Duke commits go to Louisville. I don't know if that's going to be the case or not. There's been some buzz about that. But regardless, Shire has to be right there with Miller and Thad to be the most successful in the next three years because of the pure talent coming into Duke. It's Duke. He's never been a head coach. I do think relative to expectation, the answers could be elsewhere. But big picture, GP, those got to be one, two, three in some sort of order, right? Yeah. I mean, like, who's just going to be doing the best three years from now, you know, without context or relative to expectations just like who's gonna 
be running the best basketball program, I, I, I think it's got to be John Shire. A, he's got the best job of any of these people. True, he's got the best job. Like you're, you're set up to win. Um, it doesn't mean you can't fail there, but I think any competent coach would win at Duke, just like I think any competent coach would win at you know Kentucky, at Kansas. You know, the, the, you're set up. You gotta. But you you're gotta, not guaranteed. You're but, not guaranteed, but I, I think with few exceptions, if you do the job well, you're going to really do well. Duke is one of those jobs. And as I've said a million times, you, you never know how an assistant coach is going to adapt to being a head coach on game days until you watch him do it over a period of time. Uh, there's a long list of guys I thought were – going to be great head coaches while they were assistant coaches. And then, you know, for whatever reason, it just didn't work out. Um, so I always leave open that possibility. Uh, but you, you tell me this, has any coach in the history of the sport set himself up to succeed immediately in his first job as well as John Shire has right now? That's an interesting question because well, most you, coaches are not in the situation John was where you've got a whole year to build toward before you take over. So right. this is a unique set of circumstances I acknowledge. It it is uh and this is not this is not you know an A to B uh analog kind of deal, but I remember writing I wrote a column about it a year ago um again, different school, different situation. But I actually thought that Drew Valentine, who returned every one of importance off a Sweet 16 team, except for Cameron Crutweg, was better set up than any other coach going into last season because Loyola Chicago was a, was a top 25 Ken Palm team that had just won multiple games in the tournament. Valentine was on the staff, and he got everyone except, except Crutwig, which was the best player, to come back. Lo and behold, Loyola Chicago got back to the tournament, was a 10 seed. Um, there you go. Shire has been on staff. He doesn't have all these players returning. They're going to lose a lot of their guys. So it's like what, but he has the talent coming in. So there is the unknown of the talent coming in, but yes, for Shire to have the situation, there are very few, if any kind of parallels there. And it's going to be super interesting. I did see someone mention in the comps. I did think about this recently a year ago, John Shire was interviewing for the DePaul job, you know, and he didn't get it. He didn't, but it's just so fascinating to think about, you know, the spot he was in versus where he is right now. It is is wild. And at 34, kind of goes without saying, but if you were not totally aware of this, John Shire will be the youngest head coach in a power conference uh, by a factor of two years. Uh, Todd Golden, who we'll get to in a few at, at Florida, left San Francisco. He is 36. Like if John gets that DePaul job, I think it's reasonable to assume he might not be the head coach of Duke right now. Um you know, I, I think Kay wanted John to be the head coach at Duke. So the whole, all the stuff about Tommy Amaker and it would be awkward and disruptive. I, I think that might have been to, you know, a way, okay, like I know what I would prefer. Now let me try to um, be able to sell it to everybody in the way that it needs to be sold. Um, but if John's at DePaul and Tommy's at Harvard, then you don't have the John's already here to, take over when I leave and spend the next year. It just, it, it's a much more complicated thing. And so it's always funny, like these things that you think are bad moments actually turn into blessings uh, for lack of a better word. Uh, like I'm sure when John didn't get the DePaul job um, on some level, that was disappointing. It turns out it was probably the best thing that ever happened to him because now he's the head coach at Duke. It reminds me a little bit, a year before Josh Pastor got the Memphis job, he interviewed for Rice, I think couldn't get the rice job. And then a year later, he's the head coach at Memphis. There's all sorts of these stories. We don't have enough time, but the sliding doors where coaches really, really want one. I'll give you another one. Ben Johnson at Minnesota. He interviewed for Northern Illinois, thought he was getting it, like really thought he was getting it, didn't get it. And it actually opens up where he's the head coach at, at Minnesota, where he's from and gets a power conference job. There's all sorts of yeah. these where it could have been one guy. It was, and he goes to a different situation. He's better off, worse off for it. It's, it's always an interesting thing to track behind the scenes. So now Shire is at Duke and he is set up. I mean, he's got the number one class in 2022, number one class in 2023. There's four or five star prospects in each of those classes in 2022, Kansas and Arkansas are the only other schools that have at least three five stars in 2023. Again, Duke's got four five stars committed right now. 
Nobody else has more than one in the entire country. I mean, he is n killing it. Can we just, can we just like, and I think this is fine and all above board. There's got to be, in addition to just being Duke, like we got to figure there's some NIL situation here that is being promoted to, to or these players understand it. Like this, this is so outpacing the rest of, of the field. Again, Mike Krzyzewski wasn't recruiting at this level in advance against all of his other contempt. It's just, it's intriguing to me. That's all. I'm not yeah. saying anything like below board's happening. I'm just saying this in this NIL era, I think the message has quite clearly gotten across to players that are considering Duke. It is Duke that there are significant. I mean, Paulo Bancaro, I don't know how much he just made, but between having his face on a, on a bracket games with Yahoo, the, uh, the video game, um, was it 2K? I can't even remember. Like he raked in serious money, not exactly looking to publish it. But I think that's also a huge factor, particularly as it pertains to Duke, because it's the biggest brand in the sport. Yeah. And I don't even think John would hide from that. Um, like it, it goes without saying that Duke should be able to flourish in the name, image and likeness space. It's if not the biggest brand in the sport, certainly one of the biggest brands in the sport. I would argue it's the biggest brand in the sport. Um, I know Kentucky fans would argue otherwise, but I, I I would argue it's the biggest brand of the sport. And in this name, image, and likeness era, um, of course, you're going to be able to, to to flourish if you're a Duke basketball player. And I, I'm confident that the Duke staff is making sure every prospect and prospect's family uh, understands as much. Like, John's a smart guy. You know, he understands this landscape. And so you've got a smart guy taking over, sure, at a young age, but I'm not concerned about that. Some of the uh, best coaches in the history of the sport were head coaches at a very young age. John Cal Calipari, Rick Patino, Billy Donovan, Brad Stevens. Uh, the age doesn't concern me at all. Uh, obviously, the roster building is incredible. Um, I, I, you know, I'll be surprised if John's not keeping Duke, you know, at the tip top of the sport uh, for the foreseeable future. This is a succession plan that I'm confident is going to go well. And like literally, the guy could not be off to a better start with the off the court stuff into uh, from a relative to expectations perspective, obviously, you know, Sean, you know, is, I would assume is going to do well at Xavier. I mean, uh, yeah, it's Xavier and, and I'm assuming Thad will do well at Butler. Uh, Chris Jans at Mississippi state, I think is going to do really well there. Um, like he absolutely killed it at New Mexico state, you know, 122 and 32 overall, uh, 64 and 13 in WAC games. Uh, with the four NCAA tournaments in five years, the truth is he would have already been a power five power conference coach, um, if not for the off the court incident at Bowling Green that cost him that job. Um, but he got a new opportunity at New Mexico State. Um, I mean, could not have realistically done better. And for you know, this is sort of a cliche thing to say at this point, but it doesn't mean it's not true. Like, he seems like a great fit for Starkville, Mississippi. He seems like a great fit at Mississippi State. So, uh, obviously, the ceiling at Duke is a lot higher. Killing it at Duke looks a lot different than killing it at Mississippi State, I think. But I think he can kill it at Mississippi State. And killing it at Mississippi State would be, you know, getting it back to uh, a good place. Uh, a place unlike it's been, honestly, since, you know, Rick Stansberry was nudged out of there a long time ago. Yeah, and I'll save some of this for what we're going to get to in a second here. But as I look at the list of 13 coaches and new spots here, I this is not going to prove correct. But, man, so many of these fits, I really, really I, I do. And I resist even trying to, like, think that because there are going to be coaches that don't work out. A number of these coaches will eventually be fired. There could be a couple that wind up getting promoted to bigger spots. Um, but I, I got to say, at the power conference level, and we'll tag it at the end of this episode if you're a fan of, say, UMass, URI, Murray State. We'll, we'll get in a little bit on the uh, on the notable mid-major hirings as well. But at the power conference level, I'm just I'm I'm more uh, I'm more enthusiastic about this group collectively than I would have predicted I would have been two, three, four weeks ago.